And those crises coming together will have an increasing impact on a variety of different industries. How do we actually implement the European Green Deal? What does that look like? These are the overarching shifts that we propose to the European Commission. So we need to think through our value chain. Our keynote speaker today, Sandrine Dixon de Cleve, together with other scientists from the Club of Rome, is once again not only calling for the planet to be saved, she is finally demanding action. The goal, a future worth living for us all. In a moment, we will see what a sustainable transformation in the food industry really means to Mrs. Dixon de Cliff and how she inspires progress. Reuters named her one of the 25 female trailblazers worldwide and Greenbist named her one of the 30 most influential women internationally who are driving the transition to a low-carbon economy and helping to promote green business. Sandrine has been co-president of the Club of Rome and executive chair of Earth for All since 2018. She also gives lectures and acts as an advisor and moderator in discussions in really, really complex topics. And now I would like to invite you, Sandrine, to this station. We look forward to your suggestions, to your insights, and I'm really, really unbelievably curious about your speech today. Let's give Sandrine a warm applause and welcome here to the main stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. And uh, it's really been quite fascinating walking through this hallway and seeing all these enormous contraptions, which I must say I've never seen before. What I want to speak to you about today is something that probably many of you are aware of, the need, obviously, to transform, but not quite sure how it completely relates to your industry, apart from some of the technological shifts, the regulatory impacts that you're seeing on a daily level. I want to take you back a little bit and look at the relationship with what we published, actually, 50 years ago, The Limits to Growth, and think through how is it that we got to where we are and what do we do next. If we look at the limits to growth, and obviously some of the scenarios were contested in 1972. Of course, if it had all been taken into account, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. But the fact is that Aurelio Pache, who himself was an industrialist and set up the Club of Rome, saw very clearly when he was traveling across the globe the pressure points between continuous population growth, industrial throughput, an extractive economy, and what that would do to our natural resources and to our access to food, to other products across the globe. And you can see here very clearly that when you look at that industrial output, and you look at the timing of our greatest peaking points, it's pretty much around now. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we are, since 1972, into a series of tipping points across a variety of different pollution impacts, direct boundary impacts, which have been very clearly stated by Johann Rockström, of the Potsdam Institute. And you can see since 1972 that we are absolutely peaking in a variety of areas, many of these areas which have a direct impact also on the food industry, whether you look at nitrogen and its impact, obviously, in terms of agriculture, soil carbon, etc. What's fascinating is to see that we are not the only ones now talking about the risks. I was at Davos and have been for the last 10 years systematically asking that we look at the direct risks of both social and environmental tipping points. 
And lo and behold, what do we see when we interview CEOs from across the globe? The top two years and 10 year risks are mostly going to be across the social, so that's the red bars, and the environmental risks. And the culmination of them coming together, in particular when you look at the poly crisis, what I call the three C's, COVID, climate, and conflict. And those crises coming together will have an increasing impact on a variety of different industries, including your own. And you're seeing it already now. So the global risk landscape is an interconnected landscape, and it is both an environmental and a social landscape. So let me now bring a series of big elephants in the room that are probably bigger than many of these contraptions that I've just passed. The first is very clearly that efforts to fight the climate crisis and other crises will actually not work if we only remain focused on technological solutions. And I know that we're in a tech conference. And yes, technology is important, but technology is not the only way that we are going to get out of the mess that we've created. We have to look at the demand side and consumption as well as the human side and the social impacts. Because greening the supply side is not enough, and you'll see some of the analysis that we've done has shown very clearly that the social tipping points will actually probably be greater than the environmental tipping points. We're seeing it now in terms of the social tensions coming from farmers. We're seeing it in a variety of different countries in terms of citizens who are living energy poverty every day or difficulty to access affordable food because of inflationary impacts. So we have to stop ignoring the inherent wastefulness of our economies, optimize our economies, and think through how we can enhance people's lives and livelihoods, especially in the North, because of our consumption patterns, our over-consumption patterns in most cases. Demand-side measures are fundamental. And we need to think through the essential questions of responsibility. Who's most responsible for these great tipping points that we're seeing today? And we're going to come to that in a second. But what I'm also doing with many others is to start to think, okay, what does this look like in terms of our financial architecture, our economic architecture, and our governance what is needed in order to move us through these 21st century pain points? Let's talk about those elephants. The biggest one, which is the fact that it is the one percentile of the wealthiest that have the highest emissions impact, that have the highest material footprint. It is the 10% of the wealthiest that hold most of the wealth in comparison to the most vulnerable poorest of society. Now, when I speak about this, most people say, yes, we know about Ethiopia, we know about Africa, but that doesn't really concern me. I grew up in San Francisco. Have any of you been to San Francisco recently? Have any of you seen that San Francisco is now called Poop Town? Like Calcutta. San Francisco, where we saw the greatest and continue to see the greatest wealth, has the highest level of homelessness, drug addiction, mental illness, and suicide that we've ever seen. Now, you cannot tell me that this dichotomy, this inequality, is actually only between North and South or only in the South. It is growing in front of our eyes across Europe. And that inequality, coupled with the incredible footprint, material footprint of the North, are two of the greatest tipping points that we have. That means we need transformational economics. We need to think through what then are the signals that we're getting from the economy. Because the economy is purely extractive. And I call it actually an over-financialized economy. Shareholder value is the only thing that matters. Our economy no longer really is triggered by jobs. In fact, shares go up when you fire 10,000 people. 
There is a problem with the way in which the economy is actually functioning to service people, planet, and prosperity at the same time. That is our current greatest failure, that we are not meeting human dignity or human needs, even in the wealthiest countries. So the challenge is, how do we meet those needs? What do we need to put in place? What are the trigger mechanisms? What type of economic models do we need? And we're talking about this at the European level, at the OECD, and at the international level. The focus has to be a shift away from an extractive economy where we do not cost the externalities of extraction. We don't cost the externalities even of the extraction of oil and gas. In fact, while we don't cost those externalities, most oil and gas producers are making 2.8 billion windfall profits per day on the back, once again, of growing energy poverty. This is going to create more social tension, and I will show you how that will happen. We don't take into account environmental or social risks. We don't actually understand the real needs of the global commons for people or even take into consideration the role of the state and the role of our public goods. What does that look like and how do we place inside our model rewards for moving in the right direction? for greening some of our products, but not just greening at the expense, obviously, of social issues, which we're seeing right now play out in our streets with the farmers. We need to both understand how we can actually do better in optimizing our economic models to service people, planet, and prosperity at the same time. Most importantly, to move towards well-being. And what this shows is a series of different types of models that are now starting to be implemented across Europe. So this thinking, those elephants, are what made the most noise to us as members of the Club of Rome when we decided we needed to commemorate the 50-year anniversary of the Limits to Growth. One, understand why are we still here? Why did no one listen? In many cases, because we were perceived as elitist, totally disenfranchised from the reality of what people needed, or at least that's what some policymakers told us, like Reagan, where he said there are no limits to growth. We can continue to grow. And it's true, in the 80s, we could continue to grow. Look at where we are now. The constraints are there right in front of our faces, whether it be pandemics, whether it be increasing migration from climate change, whether it be the conflicts that we're going to see increasing from the disparity because we can't have access to water, we can't have access to food. So we came up with a new thinking, a new system dynamic modeling that brings into consideration the interrelationships between those different tipping points that we were seeing in front of us. And we took into consideration the planetary boundaries and worked together to create Earth for All. Earth for All is not only a book, now translated in 10 languages, very proud that it was first translated and released here and was on the De Spiegel bestseller list for an entire year in Germany last year. But also, how do we then translate this thinking that myself and Johann Rockström, an economist, Jayati Ghosh and others, into what does this mean for the SDGs and working directly with the UN to translate that into new thinking around the SDG stock take. So what we came to are two scenarios. First scenario, too little, too late. Basically, it's today's scenario. Second scenario, so we only have two. We didn't want to complicate things. Second scenario is the giant leap scenario. How do we transform the economy? And how do we do it when you're in the midst of chaos? Because, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of chaos. We had the time 50 years ago to plan. We don't have the time to plan in the same way. And I've worked with industry. I, I know many of you are engineers. I'm an environmental engineer. My entire beginning of my career was working with incredible engineers that were coming up with solutions and continue to do so. But how do you continue to work? pragmatically and come up with solutions when you're being thrown continuous issues and complexity at the same time. That's what we needed to think of. 
We needed to think of how could we actually focus on five key turnarounds, five key turnarounds, which in the end only cost us two to four percent of global GDP. And those turnarounds are addressing the gross inequality that I mentioned before, ensuring that we end poverty, both in Europe, United States and the rest of the world. Look at empowering women. Look at the way in which diversity in boards, but also ensuring that women have access to education in countries where they don't, will have a direct impact on population growth. And what are then the key paradigm shifts that we need for that? And then, of course, transform the food system. And that's what we're going to focus a little bit more on now and transform the energy system. So this is just one of what we call the spaghettis in our system dynamic model. Here you see the interrelationships between private sector capacity, the way in which we look at GDP per person and capital labor ratios, resource efficiency. What are the interrelationships that will enable us to think through what then are possible solutions? And lo and behold, and even for Johan Rockström, famous climatologist, this was for him, the biggest aha moment. The fact is that the speed of action on the planetary boundaries is a function of the speed of action on inequality and poverty. Social tipping points are the most important tipping points. And again, we can see it playing out right now in Europe. We can see it playing out in the United States. The goal has to be achieving well-being for more people on the planet. Life satisfaction is going down. As I said, suicide rates are going up. Mental, mental illness is going up. The fact of the matter is that those that are making the most money... Does anybody, by the way, know that in the United States, CEO salaries have grown by how much since 1978? Quick pull. Does anybody know? Throw out a number. Yes? 300%. 1,400%, 1,400%, 18% increase for employees, 30% increase in some inflationary impacts. Ladies and gentlemen, if I were someone who was making very little money or really struggling on a day-to-day -day level, I would be pretty pissed off, wouldn't you? The fact of the matter is that well-being is decreasing in the wealthiest parts of our societies. And Europe is doing an amazing job in trying to create social and environmental value at the same time. And for that, I commend Europe because the United States, the American dream has turned into the American nightmare. And that is a fundamental truth. So we should not follow the American way and only speak about competitiveness and productivity, but think of how we can optimize our economies get rid of the perversities in the market like high subsidies for certain products rather than others and see if we can really anchor our value base into a new well-being model. And that is what we have done through our giant leap scenario. Because the critical feedback loop that we have seen is that if you do not actually have action on these social tipping points and on inequality and poverty, you will actually increase social distrust. You will have pushback in terms of democracies. Lo and behold, we are seeing across Europe a move towards the far right. The fear mongering. Why? Because people are miserable. There is a growing population that cannot make ends meet, whether they be farmers or whether they be citizens coal workers, et cetera. How do we work within those constrictions? How do we take into consideration their needs? What type of level of public action do we need? How do we bring in the food and energy shift within that context where we know that if we were properly going to cost food, it would be more expensive? And how do we address a reduction in the level of inequality and poverty? Because reduced social tension has to be the name of the game. And that can happen through well-being. And this is our giant leap scenario once again. Giant leap scenario shows you that you reduce your tension, whereas 
the too little too late continues to grow. And the reason it starts to stop is because we see growing wars that are taking over. These are no longer social tension. These are revolutions and these are actually wars. So let's quickly go through the food turnaround. What does that look like in terms of goals? First of all, food is a basic universal right. I had conversations when I was working at the UN Food System Summit just recently. Some African countries were telling me, no, 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 that's not my role to ensure that actually my people get fed. UN has to help me do that. How is that possible? Universal basic human rights should be access to food. Net zero starvation, poverty, carbon discussion is very important. Access to affordable, sustainable, and nutritious food. Looking at regenerative agriculture and what does that look like? Optimizing the farm to fork value chain, which many of you are doing here in terms of processing, in terms of ensuring that you're using different types of materials within the food chain. Dramatically decreasing food waste, empowering rural communities, guaranteeing living wages. And today, many of these recommendations, plus this one, I have actually sent to President von der Leyen. We need to set up a food stability board where we can think of ensuring that actually people do have access to food. Because what are the current realities? The way we farm, transport, and consume food is a huge pressure. In fact, it is a growing pressure in comparison to the reduction of emissions that we've seen in transport and energy use. And nearly one in 10 people worldwide remain severely food insecure, while 2 billion are overweight or obese. How do we actually square that circle? When you look at the analysis that we've done across the giant leap scenario, or actually the too little too late scenario, you can see the food footprint per person in the giant leap scenario is severely reduced, for example, in the United States, where it continues to increase. And this is done through nitrogen throughput with regard to the too little too late. And the same with Europe, although incredible already. The, the work that we have done across Europe, and I'm sure your industries, have made a huge difference. Look at the comparison with the United States. Bravo to all of us that are moving in the right direction and must continue to do so. But what's interesting is that if you look at how we can also bring in regenerative agriculture and think through a regenerative value chain, you can see the difference in terms of how we actually meet the giant leap scenario across the globe, in particular in the United States because of the needed shift, but also in other countries across the globe. And we've done an assessment both in terms of Latin America and also Africa because we were asked to by the Secretary General of the UN to see, can we actually move to a regenerative agriculture? What does that look like? How do we reduce that footprint? And again, because we know that reducing that footprint is fundamental, however, we need to think about cost. We need to think about social tension. We know that social tension will continue to increase, not only because of the way in which we look at regenerative agriculture or we shift our production patterns, or we actually put in the true cost, but also because climate change will aggravate. And that is important. So ladies and gentlemen, food policy is a long and short-term policy. And it's all about security. In fact, that is what I've said very clearly to once again, President von der Leyen. We need a stable food system that is both resilient, but also brings in the true cost of what we are producing. We need to think through how we can look at overconsumption and underconsumption. We need to support local production for local consumption, but also look at the impact of our imports. We need to take into consideration the farmer and rural communities because they feel totally disenfranchised and they don't feel like they are getting a fair cut of the deal through the food price and also the food system. 
We also need to enhance farmer autonomy, and I'm sorry, we need to look at the relationship between the farmer, distribution, and producers, and the intermediaries, and that is fundamental and part of the discussion in terms of the full food chain. And then we have to start to tax unhealthy and unsustainable food production because of the impact, both in terms of resources, but also on human health, and reduce consumption of industrial produced meat and dairy. Sorry to say this in this room where I know that many of you are working in this area. We also need to eliminate food waste and loss. And we know the impact that this have. And I know that many of you are working on this in terms of optimizing the end of food chain impacts. So let's quickly go through my last few slides in order to finish this and have, I hope, a very quick discussion. The first is, how do we then turn this into policy? What does that look like? Several ways. We're working right now across Europe, also with the United States, and also at the international and OECD level to think through in new indicators. What are the new indicators that will buffer productivity as the only indicator, which is our GDP economic indicator? Looking at access to healthcare, looking at access to education, looking at access to affordable food, placing a value on that within our economic model. But then the other thing we need to do, and that's the redefining prosperity and also redefining metrics, we need to look at how do we actually put in place the right policies? What does that look like? And these are the 10 key principles that myself and a former commissioner, Janusz Potocznik, actually put together for the European Commission. This means the following key points. We look at consumption from owning to using. We redefine production from mass sales to providing efficient functionalities. We look at redefining the core economic incentives, such as taxation, subsidies. Where should subsidies actually go and where should we eliminate them? And how can we create just transition funds? We have to measure sustainability across the life cycle, across policy areas, activate financial potential to enable the transition. Where should we put in capital flows? We're starting to think of the type of funding mechanisms that we need and then encourage innovation. And that's where I look at you. How do you within the value chain enhance innovation, optimization, in order to reduce waste, in order to ensure that we're producing the right things. So what we did is we started to actually translate this into new ecosystems. What do those industrial ecosystems look like and how do they work together? Here are the ecosystems up top that we thought of and then the importance of the underlining impacts in order to optimize looking at nature-based solutions, understanding the role of energy, thinking through materials and material throughput, and then information and policy and processing, and how does that work? We're getting to the end, I promise. I can see that people are getting nervous. How do we actually implement the European Green Deal? What does that look like? How do we put in place those compass principles and the system dynamic thinking that we were bringing in? So here are the key new ecosystems that we need to think about and their relationship with each other. Eight economic ecosystems. And here are the interrelationships between those ecosystems and how we can start to optimize. Looking at nature-based and the way in which it works with healthy food, but even information and processing. What are all the different interrelationships? And there we get into 50 development opportunities. And the application of the compass on each level will give us about 30 to, to 50 system level shifts within policy and needs. And they will give us also key economic ecosystem policy orientations so that we have an overview of what actually looks like a new type of ecosystem and its interrelationships. But this is also what it looks like in terms of key suggestions, in particular in the food sector. What are the champion orientations? And I know, again, this is more of a technology stakeholder engagement and obviously conference. 
But what I'm trying to bring in here is obviously from a European perspective, the focus is very much on the food system and ensuring that we actually create nutritious and affordable food for people. And this is what needs to happen across the board. But what happens when you start to think about these things and all of a sudden you get the Ukrainian invasion? And this was a specific ask from the European Commission. How can we look at the interrelationship between chemicals issues such as nitrogen, the gas price in Europe, and the food index? What are some of the solutions that you would bring forward then from a systemic perspective? And what does that look like? Well, systemic solutions would actually be the following. Protecting vulnerable populations against price spikes immediately. Diversifying the supply chains and import markets. But accelerating the substitution of increasingly costly imported products through regional and renewable resources. And by the way, again, if our value chains are fully dependent on China, as we saw during the pandemic, we have a problem. So we need to think through our value chains and the interrelationship between more of our energy spikes, our food spikes, and our chemical and material spikes. And what is that going to do across Europe and the rest of the world? So we need to enhance resource productivity and get more out of constrained supply. These are the, let's say, the overarching shifts that we proposed to the European Commission. And I'll end with this. You are here at a technology conference. You are here as part of the very important food chain. And I can see the processed meat right over there on the left when I give this presentation. And I know that some of what I've said probably feels very far from you. But this is the speech that I gave to Wall Street when I was asked to go on the floor of Wall Street. They'll probably never ask me to come back again, by the way. I said the change we need is fundamental, and it means that uncontrollable growth and an over-financial economy will crowdfund disaster. We have to put in place new indicators. It's time to change the rules of the game so people, planet, and prosperity can actually come first before power and profit. The only way to build resilience to future shocks and stresses is to invest in an earth for all. And that's what we try to say in our book and our messaging. But most importantly, what I say, and this is something that more and more people are saying, mark my words, there are no stocks, no bonds, no financial assets, no business prospects, on an unstable or dead planet. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality is that we are faced with great complexity and we are beyond six of the nine planetary boundaries. So together, we have to think about how your sector and other sectors can optimize our economy to build a world that looks at people, planet, and prosperity at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sandrine, for your great speech. I think uh, you don't have to be afraid that we don't invite you again because it was marvelous. Absolutely.